at the MLK Day event at the Devon Middle School to advertise our church and upcoming church events. We were invited to join them at this event, which the Devon Human Rights Commission sponsors. All Sundays in February at 2 p.m., we will view films that explore issues of immigration. Join us for popcorn, film, and discussion at the 8th Annual Justice Documentary Matinee Series. This event is free and open to the public. The list of films is in the current record. Please share the word with your friends. Please read all of the announcements in your order of worship. We will now begin our morning worship. Good morning, I'm Jeff Pignell. Uh, you, uh, you might know that uh, over the last 10 years I've been writing the biographies of the ministers of our church. Uh, and uh, uh, the point of this is just to sort of think about where we came from, what we have now, maybe some ideas about uh, what we can uh, do to keep our church flourishing in, in the future. So it's, uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to celebrate the lives of some extraordinary people. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Addison Elliott Steves, who was a minister here from 1949 to 1967, very appropriate for the uh, summer love and, uh, and uh, the human beings. Uh, uh, Addison Elliott Steves was born in uh, January uh, uh, 1920 in Great Maine uh, to Earl and Raymond Steves and uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, Elvira Lusmus. At the time, uh, uh, Earl Steves was a congregational minister uh, in a uh, raised congregational church, and then he moved to Ayer, Massachusetts, where he ministered to the Federated Church, and where Addison attended uh, elementary school. A decade later, uh, Earl received a call from Federated Church in Western Massachusetts, where Addison graduated from high school in 1937. He went to Colby. And uh, uh, then to Mead, uh, Meadville um, Theological School in Chicago, uh, he married, uh, met, married uh, 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 Mary Ireland, who was a schoolmate uh, from Colby uh, in 1944. And in his final year, he was a uh, Achiever at Meadville, Steve served as student body president, commencement student speaker, holder of the Billings Award for Excellence in Public Speaking, and after completing his uh, course of study, he he went to uh, Stockton, California, where he was a minister from 45 to 49. But he always wanted to get back to New England, uh, you know, to uh, close to to close to Bray, where he had been um, uh, uh, born uh, initially. Uh, so uh, he was uh, uh, explored calls in, in the Norman area, and uh, uh, he uh, accepted a call from First Church uh, and started up uh, in 1949 as our minister. Uh, during the two decades that he was in uh, Denham, he endured the impact of uh, uh, he had an enduring impact on First Church organization, community presence, and education. Uh, the main organizational transformation is interesting. Uh, uh, was uh, uh, streamlining the uh, first church and parish governance. Uh, according to Massachusetts law, there were two separate organizations. There was the parish and there was the church. And uh, uh, on the one hand, the parish was a legal corporation uh, established and it required, uh, uh, was, uh, 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 it was limited to a uh, a requirement, a legal requirement, that all towns uh, provide a uh, public um, teacher of religion. And on the other hand, the uh, church was a unincorporated voluntary fellowship. So they were, uh, they were uh, two different organizations. And they would meet uh, on the same day, the same evening, and first the parish meeting would, would occur, and then, then the church meeting. But you can imagine. Uh, that uh, uh, how easy it was to uh, imagine a minister's financial frustration in trying to coordinate two different decision-making bodies with uh, a select ambiguous areas of responsibility and potentially contradictory purposes. 
So, so uh, Addison uh, presided over the uh, formation of our current church government. Um, the, uh, uh, they proposed a, uh, a, the, a committee of deacons and parish committee folks proposed a reorganization. Uh, so the Bible has stipulated that the officers of the church would be the clerk, the three deacons, and a the church committee, that's a parish committee. Uh, what's more, the deacons would no longer have life tenure. What was a bad idea? You better not think there's a third. That was a bad idea to put somebody in charge for life. Uh, so they would be uh, uh, elected to overlapping terms of nine years. Now we have six year terms, essentially, the same formation. Uh, they would be uh, the, um, uh, you know, one part of the church committee. And the rest of the church committee would be uh, three pairs of parish committee members, each serving two years stints. And then we had a uh, clerk, uh, we had a um, uh, uh, clerk, an auditing uh, committee, and a non dating committee that they added the uh, uh, treasurer later on. But uh, this enabled him to put him in a better position to confront some of the challenges of, of growing the church. Um, the uh, priority that he does, uh, put forth first was you know, more members. So he established a Membership committee, and they go and make personal calls on uh, on uh, people who might be interested in the church. So the, the, this is the time which people you know uh, arrange the well, cards, arrange the meet uh, and, and, and chat in the songs. And so there, there was a lot of outreach to the newcomers. Uh, he raised the uh, profile of the church, so he advertised in the newspaper and. Uh, uh, the first advertisement was, this historic church speaks the language of our time to the men of our time about the concerns of our time. And then uh, every, every uh, uh, the decade and a half, on a monthly basis, uh, there would be an ad for the uh, new, uh, our new church in the transcript. Uh, he also, uh, uh, he, he would bring in reporters to uh, report on the um, committee meetings and uh, he would uh, uh, come to uh, parent meetings, um, and uh, the paper also recounted a, a plethora of uh, town events that he uh, spoke at, like sports dinners and women uh, uh, lower town discussions, uh, and uh, meetings with uh, other town ministers. So there's a lot of publicity that he sort of uh, uh, forefront. And he tended to uh, grow uh, church membership by making curricular innovations, physical improvements, and leadership professionalizations of the curriculum, they, they created, uh, they, they used the Beacon uh, Street curriculum uh, that had been designed by Sophie and Lance Foss, and uh, it came in with stuff that I learned with from when I started teaching future kids. So, uh, so you didn't have to go through long training for using parent uh, helping out in the uh, 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 RE, uh, the teacher kit would provide all the materials and a uh, uh, very well organized lesson plan. And these, uh, this curriculum had been organized by a uh, terrific uh, curriculum developers. And uh, that's something that I spent a lot of time doing, so I really uh, appreciate how good they worked with us. Second means was uh, expanding the physical plan. Uh, we had overcrowded classrooms, and the classrooms were upstairs. And, uh, and the parish hall, and uh, they commissioned David Leaf to develop our, our education. So the two-story wing of the classrooms extending through the old uh, parking lot area to the rear of the auditorium was built. And he hired a very uh, distinguished uh, 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 RE uh, um, director, Francis Bailey Woods. Uh, and uh, she she actually organized the uh, the Pareto, which is the uh, uh, organization of all the PREs and and the uh, churches. And so she was super knowledgeable, and she came in and she would do trainings, she would uh, uh, recruit competent teachers, and uh, she had a, a high quality professional development supervision. Uh, so uh, people felt uh, confident in what they did with children. So he moved on in 1968 to become minister of the Unitarian uh, Congregation in Melrose, who preached during the merger of the uh, Universalist and the Unitarian Catholic 
which is which was a movie indeed, but uh, you know it gave us our our current movie um, organization. Uh, Steve is under to his last industry in Auburn, Maine, where he served until his retirement, um, and passed away in Lisbon, Maine, on the 9th of uh, April, 1997. Kelly um, Bancroft is a, a member of our church uh, for many years, and most of us are official church uh, historian, instead of the excuse. Uh, both Ash and Marilyn were friendly and kind in times of trouble. They were invariably on hand to lend a helping hand, and every member of the church knew he or she could talk to either or both of them about anything. One member said he joined the church because of because to him, the speaks exemplified Unitarianism. <laughs> In the memory of 
the four freedoms expressed for death as the United States after World War II uh, that became part of the UN Charter of Human Rights when that was established. Uh, freedom of speech and of religion, and freedom from want and greed and fear. And the memory that, uh, that we can do something about this on international, but also national levels. And I also let our green sanctuary and the ways in which, for the ways in which we, we seek to become a more sustainable congregation. Our opening words this morning are a poem by Lawrence Berlinghetti. My favorite poem by Lawrence Berlinghetti is Underwear. If you've never read it, I suggest you do, but that's not what I'm reading today. Today I'm reading Constantly Risking Absurdity Number 15 by Lawrence Berlinghetti. Constantly risking absurdity and death whenever he performs above the heads of his audience. The poet, like an acrobat, climbs on rhyme to a high wire of his own making, on a balancing on eye beams above the sea of faces, paces his way to the other side of day, performing in trap. Entra how do you say that word? E N T R E C H A T A T A T A T A T of sleight of foot tricks and on other high theaters, all without mistaking anything for what it may not be. For he is a super realist who must perforce perceive taught truth before the taking of each stance or step in his supposed advance. Toward that still higher perch where beauty stands and waits with gravity to start her death defying leap. And he on little Charlie Chaplin man, a little Charlie Chaplin man who may or may not catch her fair eternal form spread eagle in the empty air of existence. I invite you to sing with me hymn number 162 in your great hymnal, <coughs> Lay Down My Sword and Shield, number 162. <laughs> I'm going to study for the 
we can assemble as a group as long as we're peaceful. Now, if we went out of these buildings and we started throwing rocks at people, would that be correct? Would that be the right to assemble? Not really, because the right to assemble is to be peaceful. And when we have the human being happened, people have to really gather in that way. They have had sit-ins during the 1920s, where people had sit in, sat in at their work, and that was a peaceful assembly. But to gather for an entire day in one place, singing songs and making music and reading poetry, that had never really happened in that way, except for at revivals, which were church focused, right? And when you think about it, church is really an institution, kind of like school is an institution. And what the human being was questioning and learning about was how institutions were shaping and forming our lives in a certain way. And so when we think about the right to assemble, and we want to think about the, um, the, the transformative nature of that, how that is, can make things different, it isn't, it is a chance to have people that aren't just always like me, the same, which is kind of like this church, right? So what do you get out of assembling on Sunday morning? Does anybody have an answer to this question, this big rhetorical question about that? But what you get out of gathering with friends in church who have different ideas about the world than you do? Maybe different ideas about what God is. What does that bring you? Learning. What? Learning from each other. Learning. So you can learn and maybe expand your knowledge base, right? What else? Why do you come to church? Community. Community. So you can find people to just be with and to not be so isolated, right? Sometimes. What else? Because your parents dragged you here. <laughs> Simon's got his head as far away from you as he can, so I don't ask him. <laughs> um, yes? <laughs> it, it challenges me sometimes to question the way. Challenges you to question the way you think. And it might also challenge you to do more and be more in the world, right? Outside of this place. I hope that is true for some of you. So, I believe that every right to assemble, every time someone exercises the right to assemble peacefully with a diverse group of people, that's actually what they get out of it, is some learning, some, some, what did you say? <laughs> challenge. Challenge, a challenge to be a little bit more than you are. And and then when you add to it, and yeah? So you're pointing to someone else, so. She's a community. Oh yeah, community, right? And to be with other people, but I think when when you add to that, um, when you add to that, a sense of of change or a need for growth, then it can be really transformative, and that's what community can be, and that's what I think this community is. But I also think that's what the human being is. So we'll talk more about that. Now I invite you into a time of prayer or meditation, as is your practice. And we begin by breathing in peace and breathing out love. Let us be grateful for all the silences in our lives, for with it we may more completely experience sound. The first reading was 
titled How the Human Bean Launched the Summer of Love, written by Bill Cobb in the San Francisco Standard. The summer of love has been a part of the popular lexicon for more than half a century. It is shorthand for the era of good feeling that centered on peace, love, and the hippie ethos before the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr., Robert Kennedy, and Malcolm X. And it is inextricably linked to the music and pop culture of mid to late 1960s San Francisco. But while well, the summer of 1967 didn't officially arrive until June of that year, the summer of love had its unofficial start five months earlier in Golden Gate Park. On January 14th, 1967, the burgeoning American counterculture transitioned from a loosely connected network of artists and political rabble-rousers to a fully-fledged mainstream movement with a high-profile coming-out party dubbed the Human Beacon. In their underground newspaper, the San Francisco Oracle, Alan Cohen and Bay Area artist Michael Bowen announced a gathering of the tribes for a human being. Ostensibly, a protest against the California State Legislature's recent outline of LSD. <clears throat> the human being quickly blossomed into an event with far wider implications. The event took the form of a summit of counterculture figures some appearing together on stage for the first time. Bay Area luminaries shared the spotlight with national figures. The human being featured high-profile appearances by gurus Richard Albert, Ram Das, and Timothy Leary. Poets Allen Ginsberg, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Lenore Candle, and Michael McClure. And activists Jerry Rubin and Dick Gregory among others. And there was music, a representative offering of San Francisco-based bands closely associated with the growing psychedelic scene performed, including the Grateful Dead with guest Charles Lloyd, Jefferson Airplane, and Quicksilver Messenger Service. Owsley Stanley manufactured a large quantity of white lightning for distribution at the free outdoor celebration and security, such as it was, would be handled by a local chapter of the Hells Angels. Attendance estimates would vary widely, but most accounts agree that at least 20,000 people convened that afternoon in Golden Gate Park. The event went off largely without a hitch. Apparently there were no arrests, and despite the massive crowds at the conclusion of the festivities, the park was relatively litter free. It was during his speech at the B-In, when Leary is said to have first uttered the phrase, turn on, tune in, drop out. The human being captured the attention of the media. Nothing of its kind had taken place before. The event signaled to mainstream America that the counterculture was a force to be reckoned with. Yet while peaceful in its aims and character, the being was seen as a threat by some in straight society. Its success demonstrated that leftist radicals and free-loving hippies would find a common cause and, if only for a time, work together towards shared goals.
We are surrounded by it all the time. It is exploding inside of us in a billion cells in our body. But most of the time, we can't experience it. We are blind to it. We tend to think of our external, leather-like skin body as the basic ontological frame of reference, the center of our universe. And we realize when we study biology textbooks that our body is actually a complex set of soft divine machines serving in myriad ways the needs of the cell. These concepts can be a little disturbing to our egocentric and our anthropocentric point of view. But then we just start because the fellow with the electron microscope comes along and he says, well, your microscope in your cell is nothing. Sure, the cell is complicated, but there's a whole universe inside the atom in which activities move with the speed of light. And talk about excitement, talk about fun, talk about communication. Well, now here at the electron level, we're just getting into it. And then the astronomer comes along with his instruments, and off we go again. The interesting thing to me about this new vision of many realities that science confronts us with, however unwilling we are to look at it, is this. The closer and closer connection between the cosmology of modern science and the cosmology of some Eastern religions in particular, Hinduism and Buddhism. Please join in singing hymn number 170 in your great hymnal, hymn number 170, We Are Gentle and Great People. Thank you. 
so Golden Gate Park for the human being, an event that resonates with the spirit of peace and love and music, and for some psychedelics. While opinion, opinions may let, um, waver on the latter and may differ, the universal ideas of peace and love and music remain a constant thread that transcend time with progressive communities like ours. Much like our own new tradition, the evolution from the beat to hippie movement took a very crooked path. The human being advertised as a gathering of tribes has retrospectively been criticized for misappropriating the term tribe. This term represents a linguistic misstep and carries historical connotations implying a group stuck in time before modern civilization um, marked by conflict and often used as a political term for marginalized groups. But the term also refers to an understanding of a deeply connected group of human beings. Sebastian Younger defines tribe in his eponymously titled book, The Community That You Live In, You Share Resources With, You Risk Your Life Defend, we defend, that's the real meaning of tribe. Of course, in modern society, that tribal structure has been lost. My cousin, who's not really my cousin, is here with her family. She, um, she's been my cousin since her grandfather married my grandmother on their first date the day I was born. And Kate and I are about 12 years apart because I was 12 and she was but when I was in my 30s, I think, maybe when Kate was in her 20s, we traveled to Italy, and we were like, we were our, each other's tribe, even though there's no blood between us, right? But there's, we're family. We're our tribe, each other's tribe, but we didn't always get along, and um, we, we traveled through Italy, and we just fight along the countryside, and then we we make friends again and we fight. And one day we were sitting in a restaurant and we were saying, like, we should just relax. We're in this beautiful place and just enjoy what we're enjoying. And all of a sudden we heard lean on me out the window. And it just changed the entire trip for us. It was like a turning point because we could always go back to saying lean on me to each other. And music is a big part of being able to connect in a, you know, way that transcends words and explanations. Acknowledging the potential misunderstanding and reflecting on the implications of using words that may be un unintentionally perpetuate stereotypes or misrepresent the essence of community is crucial in our time. The term tribe and carry baggage that obscures the nature of what a community and diversity that events like the human being try to embody. Some might perceive this concern as an expression of just an expression of a worldview, while others might view it as an adherence to political correctness, which is both embraced and discouraged in our time, right? But regardless, dissecting the language that we use can foster a deeper understanding between people with diverse ideas. It's important that we constantly try to dissect our language and make sense of what we're trying to say. I understand the choir was having a problem with standing on the side of love. That's not everybody can stand, right? But then they realize that there's different kinds of standing up. There's physical standing up, but there's also standing up emotionally and spiritually and globally. And so they thought again that maybe it was okay to sing this song on the side of love. I've been thinking about my my um, my, bened my benediction because I always say fix our steps. Don't let anyone to take steps. And I've been here 17 years saying the same thing. So it's time to change my benediction. I feel the same way about the dead mask out of the water. And I know they stopped using it. Of a pirate 
and it's just not a big deal to bring the water across it. But the word marauder intentionally means people who are going out to kill or um, steal something. And it has a historical reference and meaning to it. And while I guess you could say that a sports team is looking to steal games and to kill their opponents, and I like to squash my opponents myself, but um, it's all figurative, it still harkens back to the, the colonial era when natives who lived here and have lived here for hundreds of years were, cons were considered marauders of their own land. And that's why it's offensive, and that's why it should be reconsidered. What message we are trying to send, and how it affects people, that's why we're thinking about the portraits and why Jeff's been doing all these histories, is to think, do we want to be American history subject? Do we want to celebrate these histories, or do we want to reassess what we're hanging on? But I digress because the human being wasn't anything about political correctness. It was the opposite. They were about being politically incorrect. They were fighting against Timothy Leary, who was a Berkeley educated psychiatrist from Springfield, Massachusetts. And he um, had a lectureship at Harvard in 1962 with Richard Albert, who later became Ron Doss. Timothy Leary started research. Um, to study with some students to study the effects of psilocybin on human brains. And at the time, looking at human beings was not regulated by the government. So it was, it was okay to use human subjects. And Timothy Leary and Richard um, Albert helped some PhD students in experiencing with psilocybin in the basement of Marsh Chapel. Um, as Howard Thurman, Martin Luther King Jr.'s mentor, gave a Good Friday sermon upstairs. Leary always believed he was fired because the administration believed their research was untoward, and he believed the administration was myopic. Timothy Leary and Richard Albert were controversial figures who elicit minimal sympathy due to their solipsism and lack of consideration. Just a few years later, Leary and Albert were then on the Pacific Coast, working with poets and musicians to create the human being. Despite perhaps the grammatical incorrectness of calling it a gathering of tribes and promoting the misappropriation of the use of a sacred Mexican herb plant, Leary's research has contributed to a broader discussion that continues today about the types of drugs to help with depression and anxiety. Leary's attempt to, to mainstream a medication that other health professionals consider dangerous and illegal in many states would, could be considered an extremely egocentric and solvist idea, while Leary believed he was simply pushing paths of the people's limited consciousness and understanding. So I admit all of that, and I still think Leary has a point that we can all consider. Leary's words invite us to explore the vast tapestry of realities beyond our immediate perception. Leary articulates a world where the truth of the world extends far beyond the confines of our familiar time and space dimension. Leary challenges us to consider that there are infinite realities, not just our own, with each unique space-time continuum and dimension, entering into some kind of cosmic dance. The notion that numerous and diverse time-space realities can be unsettling to some people, challenging the solidity that they believe surrounds them, Yet even Martin Luther King Jr., who we celebrate tomorrow, is famous for reminding us in his letter from the Birmingham jail that all mankind is tied together 
all is interrelated, and we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment, garment of identity. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Interrelated implies that there are separate components that interact with each other. A network of mutuality also implies that there are different realities that affect each other. Yuri called us to look at the state social constructs that limit us and see that there are infinite interconnections and ways of being doing what is different in the world. This is illustrated by Yuri's encounter with a young engineer who vehemently argued that there's a singular reality defined by six physical laws. This resistance to the idea of multiple realities, common discomfort when faced with the possibility of our current perception, just one layer in a continuum of existence. Leary drew attention to the limitations of, a, of the social reality of his day, describing it as a fairly gross and static affair. Well, I'd suggest that if you have anything in your life that feels like a fairly gross and static affair, you might consider tuning in to that. And then maybe turning it off and doing something else. <laughs> Mary takes us on a journey through different scales of reality, from the complexity of the cell of the universe, cell to the universe inside an atom. The message is clear. Our conventional understanding is just the beginning. <clears throat> the closer we look, the more in interconnected our reality becomes with cosmology and Eastern religions, particularly Hinduism and Buddhism. As we contemplate our place in the cosmos, the human being. Let us approach with peace and love and music, with deeper understanding of all that connects us to each other and to the world. Let us not only celebrate the ideals of peace and love and music, but strive to choose the words that accurately convey inclusivity and richness of human connections. Yuri's call to tune in, turn on, tune in, and drop out is a call to us to wake up, to change, to get away from the rigid social norms that confine us. A year and four months after the peaceful cosmic dance of the human being, Martin Luther King was assassinated. We must always remember that calls for peace and love and music are never diminished by violence. In the face of hate, the call for peace and love and music gets more creative. And is often, there's a lot more music added to it. May we be open to exploring the infinite realities that surround us and in turn enrich our collective human experience no matter what difficulty we encounter or what setbacks we face. Thank you. 
they went snowboarding and stuff. We went up to um, Did you go? No, I didn't. I, I stood there and I watched them go down. And I stood there so long and wondered what was going on. Just watch it to laugh at us. Or, I said, no, no, no. I'm actually going to take a look back up here because they were down to the water go down. I was like, we can never just hit and laugh at you. I guess maybe I was I mean, wrestling. Yeah. 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 There is no choir right now. Where is that? Is it
I wonder if someone took the uh, live stream, but didn't, somebody took the iPad. 